Welcome back everybody. So right now we will cover the electrical control panel. <coughs> Essentially all the controls elements that go on top of the mechanical system to make this thing work as a 3D printer. So what are those things that we need to do there? One, we need to control the motion, direction of motion. We need to heat certain things like the bed and the extruder. Three, we need to extrude filament and we need to do things like correct for the bed leveling at the same time. And what else do we need? Anything else? We also have a display that shows some of the, gives a little bit of feedback on some of the conditions of what's happening on a 3D printer. And obviously we have power to, to sustain all of that because electricity is what makes everything run here. And those are the things. So how do we do that in the most simple way? So the control panel is a, is a modular build. So, so the whole panel here contains all the elements that, that now connect through wires to the rest of the system. And the panel is, is a piece of plexiglass where we just use zip ties and mount all the, all the different components simply through holes that are drilled in the panel uh, as an easy way to do it. Like, um, you know, mounting with zip ties actually is a pretty good idea. It's not, not bad. They're three cents per zip tie. If you mess up, you can do it again. And it allows you to do a modular part that can also be like if we have a, if we have a build, it's a module that can be built independently and then assembled into place. So let's begin. First of all, the plexiglass. So, in a bill of, official bill of materials contains 12 by 12 pieces of plexiglass. Here we have a, about a 6 by 12, so we cut those in half first. Uh, Amazon has, you know, like seven bucks or so for a piece of black plexiglass. And how do you drill it? So you use a, once again, a little drill bit, cordless drill. There's one trick to that in that when you're drilling through plexiglass, it can crack on you if you don't do it properly. And how do you make it not crack? Uh, lubrication. Really? So lubrication is one way, but what we do is uh, we take a, take a board, piece of board, so you're drilling through a backing of a wood board, so the pressure on the bottom, the other side of the plexiglass where it would otherwise break through, like when a drill bit catches as it starts to go out, it can actually tear the plexiglass and you want that to be prevented by punching the plexiglass against the backing so when the drill bit goes through, it goes through the plexiglass and then through the wood without damaging any of the plexiglass. Which means that if you do not get a hole in here, if you mess something up or you gotta remove something, uh, you can, it's harder to drill it here because you need to put something on the back. Uh, you cannot drill just straight through you're running into a risk of a breakage. Uh, it may or may not happen, but it pr probably will chip something, and in the worst case, you might just do like a whole crack and compromise the thing. So how do you how do, you do this? Uh, what are the, so let's enumerate the components. Big one is a power supply. The big uh, controller brain is here. So the controller brain is an Arduino board and it's, this is actually a sandwich of two boards, one on top of each other. What you see on the outside is called RAMPS, the RAMPS shield, which stands for RepRap Arduino Mega Pololu Shield. What are all those things? RepRap refers to the project this came from. So RepRap is the official open source 3D printer project, started about 2010 or so. And those are the guys that have actually changed the entire shape of the entire 3D printing world because most 3D printers today are based on the RepRap project. The largest 3D printer company in the world right now that produces 8,000 3D printers per month is Prusa. The Prusa printers from the Czech Republic. Zbinek, our guest here, he's from the Czech Republic. It's 30 minutes from his house, so you can probably see it. Um, but that project is it's pretty much fully open source came out of the RepRap project 
just like Lulzbot 3D printers, they're one of the big contenders. Um, MakerBot, which started open source and turned proprietary, they are all offshoots of the 3D printer RepRap world. A huge community, they've got a wiki, they've got an annual conference called the Midwest RepRap Festival. They also have an East, East Coast RepRap Festival now, the first one last year. Uh, but it's a live, vibrant community that develops the hardware and software. The software is Marlin. It's called Marlin. It's one of the most, uh, most printers run Marlin. We run Marlin. That's the firmware, the stuff you upload to the Arduino to make this thing run. So that's RepRap. Arduino is the board. You cannot see it underneath. There's an actual sandwich of all the pins on the top board. They go into the sockets on the board below, which is the Arduino. It's a particular version of Arduino. There's many kinds of Arduinos in different forms. This is called the Arduino Mega. Arduino Mega is the one that has a lot of those output pins, so it can handle more things than other. You can get a tiny little Arduino Mega that's just a little minimalist thing, um, but all of them have a microprocessor that does the controls. Pololu. Pololu is, refers to the stepper drivers. On the, rep, the ramps board, you see five of these little chips that plug in, and they are the devices that send the correct sequence of electricity to the stepper motors. Stepper motors are not just a regular motor with two leads that just goes on and off. It actually indexes on the inside. It's got uh, 200 steps per revolution what it means, it's, it's got a bunch of magnets, like coils, around, arranged in a circle. And depending on how you electrify those coils, you can get just one step, another step, continue. So you have a way to, to obtain precise controlled motion through the 3D printer. And you can also do partial stepping by like turning on one magnet and like turning on magnets in different combinations. Now, how do you get that kind of a logic? It's that Pololu little circuit, which gets signals from the Arduino. And Arduino just gives it the step number and a direction. Like basically two signals from the Arduino go into that chip, and that chip breaks it down into a high frequency pulse of signals, like a, I don't know, like a kilohertz or um, a few kilohertz signal. So you're basically turning on magnet after magnet through four wires. You actually need four wires on these stepper motors, uh, which plug into the, those stepper drivers. So those are called stepper drivers, the things that actually drive the motors, more than just a simple on-off. It's a complicated sequence of on-off signals. That's the Pololu. And shield refers to the fact that the ramp's shield is uh, like a shield that slaps into, plugs into the, the base Arduino board. So we'll go through that. Got the power supply, standard $20 off the shelf power supply. The Arduino and the RAMS board, they're very common off the shelf parts. Next, <coughs> you've got an LCD screen. So that gives you feedback like temperatures. You can actually do controls like how fast you're going in real time. Um, we'll, we'll turn it on. We'll see more about how that works. It's very useful because for example, if you plug in the sensors, there's two temperature sensors in the system. We'll go through the wiring later, but you need two of them. One is to control the temperature of the nozzle. You're extruding for PLA, polylactic acid, the material that these are printed from. We're extruding that at 210 degrees Celsius. You need to keep that specific value on constantly so that the thermistor, the thermal sensor, detects that, gives the feedback to the computer brain here, and it controls it. it, turns it just turns it, flips it on and off to get the right temperature. It, you'll see that the light will just blink, so on, off, on, off, on, off, to, and the duty cycle of that, meaning how, how long it's on, how, how long it's off, will determine the temperature of the sensor, of the, of the extruder. If it's fully on, it can go up to, uh, the extruders that we have, they're rated for up to 300 degrees Celsius, which means you can print we do have a high performance uh, hot end which can print in any material from PLA, ABS to, to high temperature ones such as polycarbonate, uh, rubber, rubber is not high temperature, but polycarbonates, nylon, can print in nylon, 
Uh, you can think about if you have a dual head, you can think about nylon embedded rubber tires. How about that? That would be very interesting. I get too uh, much there. Thank you. Okay. Um, the 200 in time is uh, in Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius, that's really hot. It's not like 212 Fahrenheit, which is 100 Celsius. This is pretty hot. And also the guys from Michigan Tech, they've done some prototypes where they're actually using one head to extrude thin wire. Well, no, they're not. They're not doing that. They're, what they're doing is they're, they're actually wrapping wire around the form and they're printing over that so you get metal, metal wire embedded in plastic. They print around it, so you can get composites that way. But think about this: what if you have a very, very thin wire from a master car? You can get down to very tiny, like a fraction of a millimeter, maybe a tenth of a millimeter, very tiny wire. What if you had a a hot wire head in addition to the extruder head? I believe you can do metal embedded 3D printing right out of the extruder head. You'd have to get it. You have to figure it out. The wire would have to be thin enough that it actually, when it goes in there, it doesn't mess up the whole print because obviously metal is much tougher, much stiffer than plastic. So it will tend to, like if it's still not fully, fully solidified plastic, it will just rip it, rip the plastic. So if you get the right combination of the exact timing and the distance away from, like say right after the print, you're embedding it right as it's starting to solidify, you can probably get that to work. I don't know of anybody that's done it, but I can definitely foresee the possibility of metal embedded 3D printing. So you got composites straight out of a 3D printer like this. So that that'll be. You can make those sandwich circuit boards. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and in <laughs> fact, that's actually very interesting because you can make circuits. That would be another way to make circuits yeah. if you can terminate those wires in controllable fashion. Yeah. So. I think that's actually very exciting potential. You can also, of course, put like the the guys from Michigan Tech. They they've done a lot of this kind of work. You can put a a MIG wire welder head on this, so you're actually depositing in metal. And of course, this is sparking all over, so you'd have to have the protection or a different physical setup, so all that can happen. <coughs> uh, MIG or TIG welding can can happen on a machine like this as well. So that's the temperature sensors. There's another temperature sensor in the bed. You're keeping the bed around maybe like between 40 and 100 or 120 Celsius. Uh, the way this bed is designed, it's, it's got a PEI surface, which is a high performance plastic that allows the print to stick to it when hot. When it cools off, it's very easy to pop off. But you need control on the temperature to keep that bed at a, at a constant rate, constant setting. Next is your, uh, we have one element here called the uh, MOSFET field effect. It's a transistor. It's a device that turns the bed on and off. What we've seen with the, the ramps boards, because the bed, especially if you scale it up like to a one meter square surface, that takes a bit of current. Currently it takes about 16 amps at 12 volts. It's about 200 watts or so. But the little uh, controller board has these transistors on it, but because the leads are so tiny there, they tend to burn out. This, these kinds of boards are not really designed to handle so much power. So one way to get around that is to send that on signal to a stronger power handling element. So that's what transistors are. Transistors have been developed in the 50s. They're a critical part of our current infrastructure, very tiny transistors. They're just on-off switches for electricity. They're what's inside our computers and the whole modern industry st since the 50s. This is a big one. It's just on-off. The logic there is binary. <laughs> a computer has much, many of these, very tiny, that create logic. Logic is just the, how a sequence of electricity is turned on and off. But the logic there is just on-off for the heat bed. So you're sending a little signal and that signal is amplified to turn on these big wires that come straight from the power supply and that goes to the heat bed. So think of it as a, as a light switch for high power. Uh, whenever you're dealing with switching a lot of current, whenever you make that contact, the deal is you get a little spark if you were just to connect wires. That only, you can only do that a few times before the spark just wears out the wires. That's called, uh, what do you call that? Uh, um, there's actually a machining process where EDM, electric discharge machining, 
that's what you're doing one time electric discharge machining whenever you turn a switch on. What happens there, the spark that happens, it ab ablates the metal and before, before long you, you will break the switch, it won't work anymore. So that's why you use different, uh, a device like a field effect transistor, a transistor, so call it a transistor as a general term. This is a transistor that takes a small current and then it switches a large current. It's a very powerful concept. That's what all the semiconductor devices are about. There are various combinations of semiconductors that can switch current, and for high performance ones means you switch it like instant, meaning like a nanosecond <coughs> or microsecond, and you can switch lots of current. So for example, for an induction furnace, you have things like that, they're gonna be bigger, they might be switching like 100 amps or 1,000 amps, but the semiconductor technology is what allows you to do that. And since the transistor was invented, you have uh, switch mode power supplies, what is called switch mode power supplies. So the way these things work is you take 120 AC from the wall, but we're using 12 AC, it converts it to 12 AC. So, 12 DC, direct current. The way it does it actually uses transistors in there to switch things, switch things around. So instead of using transformers, you can use fast switching to accomplish the same thing. So that's, that's the concept in a, nut, in a one sentence of, of what's known as a switch mode power supply. Uh, which means that you can make these things tiny. Like, you can have a welder, like our two, like Millermatic 200 welders that have a big transformer inside of them. They're pretty big. Or with modern technology, you can use transistors to do that, and that same welder would be tiny. You could probably, you know, fit it in a small box like that. It would be like 10 pounds. But that's modern technology, which uses switching. Now, switching has losses, so the high-performance deals, they have very minimal loss upon each switch because you're, you're talking about mm -hmm. switching at kilohertz like thousands of times per second. And switching losses are less than heat losses, right? They are heat losses. They're just reason. Mm. I mean less than transformer losses. Yeah, yeah, they are. I think uh, it depends, depends because there's also high performance transformers as well. Mm -hmm. But the power electronics based on transistors are in the 90s, 95s, 98, maybe up to 99% efficient. So yes, that would definitely be more than a transformer. And that, we were talking that the welder, the transformer welders just take way more power on the generator, whereas as an inverter welder, it doesn't load down the generator as much. So you can see that that means the trans transformer is wasting more power. Um, but there's current technology that also, I don't know what's it the latest on transformers. On the, the transformer has a balance. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So that's the switch for the heat bed, which takes a lot of current. The main heat drawing element here is the, the heat bed, which takes about 200 watts. So the heater element in the extruder takes about 40 watts to melt that plastic as it goes down. Now you can run, if you're talking about being elect electrically efficient, you can run without this heat bed, cause, but you can do things like painter stick actually works well and the ABS and PLA will stick well to it and you don't have to heat it. But the problem is you can't really take them off that easily after you're done either. <coughs> so you use this high performance plastic so that things come off very easily at the cost of electricity. Um, and, I, and I think it's worth it in production because the, if you talk about the operating costs of this, if it's 200 watts, Every five hours, you're using about a kilowatt hour. So every five hours, it's costing you 10 cents to run this. So it's not bad. But if you have a whole farm of these, I mean, the costs add up, but still the value of production that you're getting out of that is huge. So um, in production, you want to use a high performance thing like this, because the tape, if you had to reapply the tape because you ripped it, because you know the part wouldn't come off, you can only do it so many times. And that becomes, for production, it's not, it's not practical. So you want to use a high performance surface for, for printing on. People used to use glass or straight on aluminum. Glass would break sometimes. Glass doesn't work as well. This is the, 
the highest tech way to do it right now. There's some other things. Uh, other people have Teflon. I'm not sure how things might stick to Teflon because Teflon is very nonstick. Yeah. So uh, depends. Uh, this one I know. I don't know too much about the chemistries of these things, but we know this one works. That's industry standard for. Um, Wolzbot uses it. The Prusa, the most popular printer, uses it. So the cutting edge stuff does use the, this kind of plastic. So we are trying to do that. Hey, I lost my internet. Um, yeah. Okay, well, the recording is happening. Um, let me see if I can refresh, but maybe if people can turn off theirs if anyone is using it. Okay, so that's the field, field effect, that's the transistor power handling element. Did I miss anything? The, the LCD screen attaches to these big two wires uh, on the, to the bottom of the board, but the, the problem statement right now is to attach one, two, three, four. Hey, it's just four components. We can do that pretty quickly, so let's not get lost. Um, the power supply gets four, four zip ties, so one on the, one on the edges, then zip tie there. So for a zip tie for this, you're actually we're actually going through this. We're actually going like inside one of these cracks and winding through on the other side. But you need two holes, two holes, two holes. Whereas on the edge, you need only one hole. For this this transistor, we've got one zip tie there and one zip tie in the other corner. For the for the screen, we got one here and one there. All these have those holes already there. So the Arduino we're using, um, I think three. And the Arduino itself has holes. All these things have mounting holes, so it's convenient to use zip ties and stuff. Otherwise, you might like screw it on with a little screw or something. The zip ties are fast and efficient, so it's good. And then you have four, four more mounting points of the plexiglass to the actual frame. So here, on the edge, you can have one hole going through the frame. And we already drilled those holes. So the hard work is done. This is going to be easier. Here we've got one hole. It should be one hole on all four corners of the plexiglass. And we do have different size machines. So this is 13 inches here, and we have 14 and 16. Because it's a 12 inch thing, you're gonna kind of be dangling in the air, uh, like on the corner for the large machines, because uh, you're gonna have about 14 <coughs> inches of space. The board itself is 12, so the zip ties can catch that no problem. When you have the smaller frame, the, the plexiglass will sit on a metal. It doesn't matter if you have if you have free hanging. That means it will be more shock absorbed when the printer is moving really fast. So both ways work. Um, the only other element is that the LCD you can run it from an SD card, so you don't need to be connected to a computer. One of the ways to run it is straight. You, you put your files, G code files, on this, plug it in, and you can run hit print from the controller. So you don't need it to be tethered, or you can run through a USB cord into the Arduino. But then if your computer goes out, the print goes out too. So, so there's more failure, I, I would say, there. It's more robust to have the card in here. So you're eliminating one extra element of disruption. That's about it. And besides, after we're done with that, there's a bunch of wires. And the wiring is essentially get power to, to the heat bed, you get power to the controller. Um, the wiring to the steppers is a plug that goes into each of the, the stepper drivers. There's two thermistor connector connectors. There's two end stops. We haven't talked about the end stops yet. These are these things. They're limit switches. Once the, uh, they're, they're actually also magnetically attached, but that's pretty simple to do. We'll, we'll attach those magnets. Because what you can do on these, these are actually self-holding because you can put a magnet on one side and the other. They can put glue on one side and then take off the magnet from the other side because it will hold through the plastic. So this is easier to make. Uh, the plugs, they plug in, so plug and play. Um, so after we do the all the components on, we do the wiring. But let's let's get to that later. It's relatively straightforward. Like if, if everyone follows and makes the same connection one after another, it's it can go relatively benignly. Um, but the next task is to mount mount the four just four components, and it's and the location is not that critical as long as you fit everything. Only one consideration is actually this. In a, we'll look at the machine down there. We, we won't take this because the other one has the updated version. It's actually here so that this one single wire, we didn't have to extend it. Right now, I extended this wire through an extender 
to reach to where it needs to go right here. But if we mount it here, you, you don't need an extender off the wire that already comes with the with a switch. So we'll move that close. The only difference down there is the LCD is more here. The transistor is here, so it reaches directly. So four components. That's it. It should be a piece of cake in principle. So. Let's try it. Uh, any questions on the general components, what they do? No? Probably, okay. Probably soon. Okay, soon we will. Uh, so, right now, all of us help whoever's not finished put together everything that's down there. And I think there's like a couple of machines that may not be complete to the level of Z axes, X and Y. We'll worry about the bed later. Let's do the electronics right now. And maybe get some, uh, what yeah, was get them connected. The bond piece on the stepper again. On a stepper? Yeah, that is. Yeah. This thing? Yeah. That's the end stop. It's a limit switch okay. that detects. So you'll see that um, when the axis moves all the way to it, it will trip it. It clicks it. It is, stops the axis. Is there one on, there's one on each axis. There's going to be one on the X. Click, and what's on the Z? Is there an end stop on the Z? There's no, no. Bed, bed you, sensor, right? on the you got the sensor, and that sensor plugs into the same same kind of a plug, but it's a sensor. It's not a mechanical switch. It's an electrical inductive sensor. It senses the presence of metal. What's its range on the sensor? This is eight millimeter distance sensing. This extruder we modified from their stock four millimeter distance sensing, which would have to be closer to the bed. Because we want to go large, we wanted to keep that distance bigger so we never hit the prints by mistake. Uh, the way you can hit the prints in theory, you never would, but if things come off the bed, like if something warps, you're talking about thermal effects. If you don't get the first layer connected to the, to the bed, the print might pop off. You might hit things like the sensor, you might break it. So I, I wanted to have the larger sensor so that we can be more resilient on, a, on that failure mode. Yeah. Can you read resistance of the stepper? Can you read resistance? Yeah. Sure. So you could use that instead of the limit switch to tell you where you're... Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. You can. That would require a different design. It, it's the identical design, except you're using, instead of these stepper drivers, man, how? No, there's a different circuit design. And that's I'm amazed. amazed. No. Um, <laughs> not a different circuit design, because there's a version of, a, of this Pololu driver. It's not called the Pololu. It's a different one. It's the state of art that came out like a couple of years ago. But it does read the resistance, and when it hits it, it trips by itself without these sensors, without these limit switches. But you have to tune it because the resistance has to be, like you don't want it, like when you have a rough spot in the axis, you don't want it to stop there. Yeah. So you gotta definitely calibrate it, but that's, in fact, the Prusa 3D printer does do that, right. and that's like the latest thing in a, in a business. Uh, the interesting thing about it is, one, you don't need, you don't need the end stops because you, you're mechanically, hit, detecting, hey, I, I, I went against the limit, like physical limit, and just stops it immediately. The other thing about it is that um, the one, oh, it's not related to that, to that uh, stepper driver, but they also, the, so the Prusa 3D printers right now have the, the, the part where if you turn off the power, it actually stores the locations in the controller, and it can resume even if you interrupt power, which is like, wow, that's pretty, pretty advanced. We're not there at that point. That requires different electronics there. One more question. Yep. Can you use a liquid level bed? Liquid level bed? Like a tray, put some shampoo oh, in so there, and then put the surface on top of the shampoo. Oh, interesting. So um, possibly. Never tried it. Okay. But, uh, uh, the, but you do have to consider the second part, which the bed leveling accounts for, it's not the level of the bed itself, it's the level of the axes too. Okay. So it accommodates for both. Okay. You wouldn't have that accommodation if you have just the level bed. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? 
All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's go down and build it.